Welcome to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And for more than 10 years with SNN, I've been doing interviews with microcap management teams at investor conferences globally, as well as online. Our SNN Live CEO video interviews are meant to pique interest, and then one can discover more by going to that company website. But personally, I always have more questions I want to ask. On this show, I'll be chatting with public company executives from microcap companies, and we'll dive deeper into companies that are rarely profiled. Microcap traditionally is overlooked, unloved, and absolutely never featured on legacy financial media outlets unless something material is going on that's a good story. With my experience interviewing management teams, having interviewed most of them before, I've built up a network of companies, so there will be no shortage of content. Furthermore, this is an opportunity for me to showcase some of the qualitative lessons I've learned from guests on the Planet Microcap podcast. You can expect high quality interviews with management teams that may have exposure to broader macro trends that you may never have thought of. One of the many reasons why I love the microcap space. So if you love microcaps and especially love learning about companies before the professionals do, let's start our due diligence. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Anne Hand, CEO of Super League Gaming. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is SLGG on NASDAQ. Super League Gaming builds and operates networks of games, monetization tools, and content channels across metaverse gaming platforms that empower developers, energize players, and entertain fans. The company's solutions provide incomparable access to an audience consisting of players in the largest global metaverse environments, fans of hundreds of thousands of gaming influencers, and viewers of gameplay content across major social media and digital video platforms. We've had a couple gaming companies on due diligence thus far, and I wanted to invite Anne on because as you'll hear, we're still in the very early innings with many ways entrepreneurs are looking to capitalize on all the tailwinds for the industry. Anne and I discuss all of this, plus Super League Gaming's platform, connecting gamers, game creators, and advertisers, what deploying an advertising campaign looks like, Anne Han's background and how she's channeling her past non-gaming experience into this new venture, and working within the Minecraft and Roblox ecosystems. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Anne Hand, CEO of Super League Gaming. Welcome to the due diligence series here on our Planet Microcap stream. My name is Robert Kraft. I'm your host here. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And joining me today is Anne Hand. She's the chairwoman and CEO of Super League Gaming. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is SLGG on NASDAQ. And thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me, Bobby. It's great to have you on. Um, I, I was just telling you offline that I've had, I think we had only one other gaming company uh, on the show, but in the last year, it, it we've we've been covering it quite a bit. And, you know, as opposed to, you know, cannabis or maybe some of these other growthy type sectors, there are a seemingly infinite number of ways that one company could fall under the the platform of gaming. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you taking the time here so we can figure out how Super League Gaming is attacking that. So to start us off, can, can you give us that one sentence that best describes Super League Gaming? Uh, yeah, so Super League is a set of game worlds and a content network supported by proprietary technology that connects players, everyday young gamers, creators, the game developers themselves inside these open world platforms like Roblox and Minecraft uh, to advertisers. And we are the, the the company that provides the tech and the capability to connect those three constituents. Very good. All right. So let's uh, let's let's uh, go down uh, the history road here a little bit. So what was the original problem that Super League Gaming was looking to solve? And I, and I think it was founded prior to you joining the company. So also at the same time, 
what was the opportunity that you saw here as well and why you wanted to to join the team? Yeah, the company was about six months old when I joined. Um, the original premise was that there was a lot of smart money that was going into professional esports, esports teams, leagues, franchises. Um, and the fact that, you know, kids these days, their number one favorite activity is gaming. And so is there a way that you could think about um, creating a little league of video gaming? Um, have them have the same excitement to participate maybe in Minecraft leagues as they would going to their Saturday morning um, little league or AYSO soccer soccer match. Um, so so that was the focus was about three billion gamers on the planet. A very small percent will ever be at that elite pro status. But just like I played tennis as a kid and I knew I wasn't going to be Serena Williams, I still wanted to play competitively throughout you know, my my life, my high school and college years and still enjoy that activity today. Um, what kind of brought me there and, and what my lure was, because my first reaction was not being from the gaming industry. Um, you know, my games are like Galaga and Centipede, I often tell people. And so I was a little intimidated by the space and how much gaming's changed. You know, it's just, it's so, there's so many genres of games and it's, it's um, so rich in community and things that, that weren't around when it was just you playing against the machine when I was a kid. Um, and so I went to some of the early Super League events. And the thing that, that kind of got me, you know, in the heart of it was when I looked out and I saw the diversity of who a gamer is these days. This notion that it's an introverted boy um, hiding in his basement. Um, you know, the 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 notion that it's something you grow out of, like the way it did for my generation. I realized there was an opportunity to debug that myth, that everyone's a gamer these days. They don't grow out of it. There's a lot of rich STEM learning and rich, positive community in gaming. And I wanted to shine a light on that. I mean, gaming, you know, is gender neutral. A young girl can be as good as a boy. A physically challenged player with the right peripherals can can you can create a level playing field for them as well. And, and I got excited by that, that opportunity to really change perceptions about gaming and frankly prove that gaming could be positive, inclusive, and, and good for you. Absolutely. And and speaking to your background, it's not like you just didn't come from gaming. I mean, you were at BP for over 10 yeah. years. Uh, you know, you yeah. were in a construction company before that. So for yeah. you, I mean, how what was that education gap like for you? And now yeah. Super yeah. League Gaming, here you are. You know, the good news about being in large cap companies for 20 years is they really make you a generalist. You know, you do a sales job, a marketing job, operational jobs. You know, and making it is when you get to run big global P&Ls and, and big global brands. And I had the benefit of being an executive at BP and running several billion dollar businesses. And so that really kind of gave me a very well-rounded toolkit, which in many ways is the good toolkit to then jump off and try running startups or early stage companies. Because you do understand what scale looks like. But let me tell you, running early stage companies is not for the faint of heart. You know, you're starting from ground zero with no infrastructure and you're trying to do something no one's done before. And so I would say the first startup that I ran, it was a deeply humbling experience. By the time I got to Super League, I would say one of the draws for me, even though I was completely an interloper into the gaming space, I, I really have always felt like I have good brand instincts and consumer instincts. And I run a lot of consumer facing brands or turned consumer facing brands around. And so that was calling to me to kind of get back into the, the B2C kind of consumer facing world a bit. Um, now, I will tell you the first few years at Super League, you know, I would definitely inside my mind at times feel like, wow, what am I doing? You know, I'm I'm, I know it's good in some perspectives that I'm an outsider coming in because I have a fresh set of eyes. And I will say I felt a very collegial welcome. People in the gaming industry weren't looking at me like, who are, who are you and what are you doing here? I think the timing was good that gaming was becoming central to the entertainment industry. It was no longer on the fringe. And so people took it as a sign. Wow, people want to come from other industries in. That must mean our industry is on top. Um, that said, I struggled for quite a while with that energy to esports gaming language. It was it was such a change. And um, and I had a really wonderful friend 
help me out. Um, he was, I was talking to him. I was a few years into the company and he said, why do you keep apologizing for, you know, your very different background? Like you keep making it like it has to be explained. And he's like, but you know, you're versatile. Isn't that like, why can't you just answer the question? You're versatile. And what was fascinating, I, I often think this was one of the biggest, you know, we all, as we go through our work careers, have these moments, these inflection points where we, we learn something about ourselves. And that was definitely one of those moments for me where I realized, you know, just like I like to change the brand narrative about different offers and brands, I needed to change mine. And I started practicing using the word versatile. And I was on a panel a couple of weeks later at the Milken conference. And it's a classic question I always get answered. Now, Anne, let's talk about, you know, huh, energy, gaming. And this time I didn't, I just said, hey, you know, I guess I'm versatile. And the crowd laughed. And after that, I started to really celebrate it and lean into it. And what I'm finding now is when I'm talking to the CMO or the C-suite of big brands that we all know and love and explaining why Super League can help take them in a very de-risked way into these open world games and help them reach this coveted young audience of gamers I think it's actually the diversity of my background that I can credibly sit there and say, I know this sounds foreign to you. It was foreign to me eight years ago, but it's not that foreign. And I think maybe they they trust me a little bit more because I'm not so entrenched in it that I maybe have blinders on about it. Absolutely. And I so appreciate that answer, too, because especially in microcaps, you know, we we I mean, I've interviewed so many management teams that definitely did not come out of industry. Right. Yeah. That yeah. for the companies that they're running, That's you know, right. even amongst mining companies, people, you know, they get all up in arms like, oh, they they discovered a copper company and now they're running a gold company. You know, it's like, hey, look, they, they have success. Uh, give, yeah. give them a little credence. Right. Um, right. At, at and, then, and there is there is a set of questions that you're trained to ask. You know, if if all of a sudden you have a labor challenge or a supply chain challenge or a pricing challenge, um, you know, those kinds of questions. And the thought process is similar, regardless of the industry you're in. And so those those capabilities, those skills do port. Absolutely. And look, at the end of the day, you know, that experience can it, it goes both ways, right? It can okay. either it could either purport future success or there's plenty of examples of absolute horrible destruction and failure of shareholder <laughs> value. So, yeah. you know, it, it kind of goes both ways. That's right. But that but that's why we do things like this because we want to get to know you better. Yeah. Um <laughs> so let's dig into the business a little bit. You know, as you said uh in your in your opening answer is that you know Super League is really all about connecting those everyday gamers game creators, and the advertisers. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about how the company exists today and how the company is bringing in revenue. Yeah. So, so you know, as I mentioned, in the early days, we had this idea about, you know, youth leagues built around people's video gaming passion. And we started with that game Minecraft, right? Because again, very positive roots of STEM learning. Kids love it. It speaks to a wide audience of different types of, of players. Um, we gave out scholarships to our winners. We had a seven-year-old get a scholarship to college. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. And um, and what we realized, because I often say to investors, look, we're not saying metaverse games to jump on a bandwagon here. We're talking about open world gaming platforms. And those have been around for over a decade, right? And you don't need a VR headset for it. So we're really talking at Super League predominantly about Minecraft and Roblox and this large 70 million unique players we now reach across those two platforms each month, um, which is a sizable reach that we have of an under 18 gaming audience. Um, so there was a point where we realized that just thinking about just the super competitive gamer, we, were, we needed to cast the net wider. And so starting a few years ago, we said, well, what about the player who loves to create in these games? Maybe to make a game or maybe build a skyscraper. What about the, the person who's really there for the social component? And so while we still have a very strong foothold of highly competitive gamers in that 70 million reach that we talked about, we also can speak to all those other types of gaming segments or, or audiences. And why that matters is because um, what we've been doing over the last few years specifically, as we've really doubled down on this, this lane of young gamers and these metaverse game platforms, 
is we've been building out tools for the creators themselves. So what does that mean? Well, it, it's ad tech and it's analytics that helps the people who make the games make better games, um, learn more about how to optimize their games, but also participate in our ad economy. So if we bring advertisers into the game worlds they've made, they get to participate in that. So there's a creator economy thread that's very important. We continue to run really compelling game worlds for players in that 70 million reach that we have. But then through partnering with these other game developers through our ad economy, we now have access to bring players into their games as well. So we have about 200 top tier games in just Roblox alone that are part of our game world network. Um, and why that matters for the advertisers casting that wider net is because now you'll see just announced today that um, we're bringing Barbie and Polly Pocket into the metaverse for Mattel, right? So the Barbie girl is very different than the Hot Wheels boy. Um, the Barbie girl doesn't necessarily want a heavy competition and winners and losers. The Barbie girl wants to create and play and, and more like role-playing type games. So with that really wide net that we now have of reach inside Minecraft and Roblox, we can target the right types of game worlds and experiences that speak to those different types of audiences that advertisers had. Now, we did just announce a few weeks ago that we are introducing what we believe is the first eSports hub inside Roblox. So in some ways, going back to our roots, we still can talk and do talk to that really highly top tier competitive gamer, young gamer as well. But I just love the richness. It means that, frankly, there's no advertiser that we can't successfully create a campaign for. Now, when I talk about how we make money, um, about 70% of our revenues are through this advertising model. Now we do also, when we own and operate game worlds, we also can participate in the direct to consumer monetization in that game. So if you buy a new cape or sword for your, for your avatar, then we get a, a share a share of that, just like anyone who operates a game world inside those different platforms. So we do have some direct to consumer revenue. We also um, resell our content, and so and we have some kind of tricked out technology that 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 produces content. So that's a third leg of revenue. We like those two legs of revenue because a they're having nice growth to them, even though they're small in size to the ad model. But also we like them because it smooths out a little bit of the inevitable seasonality that an ad model would have. We we certainly have a high concentration of our revenues in Q4, as you'd expect, with all the holiday spend um, that occurs. Um, as far as the ad model, though, in itself, what's really exciting is how rich it's become. And what I mean by that is... For example, and the Barbie girl is a good example of what we're doing for Mattel. The first thing that we can do, and it really makes us an end-to-end -end solution or a one-stop shop for advertisers. The first thing we're going to do is we bring um, a Barbie gameplay experience into an existing game. Um, we've done this with countless other brands. We did it with, we do it with SpongeBob, Nickelodeon, and Paramount's also one of our investors. Uh, we've been bringing MTV, the VMA Awards, um, the Wild and Out Rap Battle Show into game worlds. So we really know how to create an immersive game experience. So in the first instance, um, Barbie is, we're recreating Barbie's dream house um, inside a wildly popular Roblox game that really speaks to the Barbie girl. Um, and so that will be a several week experience where players will be able to unlock different levels, um, to, to see different bar decades of Barbie as, as the weeks progress. Um, but we, we don't stop there. We also through, and some of this is through our both or organic growth and M&A, we have a whole suite of media ad products. Um, and these ad products are dropped into other game worlds beyond where the dream house is. And this is how we drive more traffic and excitement to the dream house. So maybe you're in another game that you love in Roblox and you bump into a Barbie. She's a 3D non-playing character and you can talk to her and she can give you an invitation to her dream house. And if you say yes, then you can teleport into that dream house world. Or it could be a dynamic billboard that you see out in the landscape of the map. Again, these aren't pop up um, kind of the annoying ad units that we know so well from the Internet. Um, and, and what, you know, people use ad blocking technology to avoid. 
These are ad units that are highly innovative, very high CPM, um, and they're integrated into the game experience. They enrich the game experience. Um, and so we have these exciting ways that we can take the dream house experience in one world, but then augment it with all of these innovative media products that have Barbie engaging in all kinds of other worlds to drive traffic back. And then we always have a third component, which is now we want to blast it into the universe, right? We've got all this exciting immersive gameplay where we're driving players and engagement hours all around this love of Barbie. But then what we want to do is we want to always help the advertisers as well um, achieve their viewership objectives. So we're often live streaming content out of gameplay or clipping content for social posting to, to drive and check that box so that we really can manage an end-to-end -end campaign for Mattel. And I should mention that we do all of that COPA compliant and we have our kids safe certification. And that matters too, because Mattel wants a one stop, but they also need a really trusted marketing channel. And, and that's where I think we distinguish ourselves. Absolutely. Okay. So there's a couple rabbit holes I want to get into because I also want to clarify things too, a little bit. Right. You know, you mentioned that, you know, the company works within Roblox and Minecraft. Can you just explain to us what the nature of the relationship is with Super League Gaming and some of these bigger platforms? Do you create games within their platform and that's where people then go and, and interact? Is that how that works? Yeah. So let's talk first about Minecraft um, because that's what we've been working with Minecraft for, for eight years. And we've done a lot of, of fun, different um, pilots and trials with Microsoft, their parent as well. Um, we ran an after school program around Minecraft and LA Unified Schools. Um, as I mentioned, we have the Little League system that we run. Um, also MineCon, which is their annual big conference. We've supported and run kind of distributed MineCon events um, across the US. So we've always had a really nice strategic partnership. And again, it goes back to, we've always been known to be very trustworthy with the brand and the community, right? That we really stand for safe gaming, um, over time, what's happened with our Minecraft business is we have been kind of quietly growing what is now considered the largest um, networked private server farm in the world. It's called Minehut.com, and we own and operate it. What it means first and foremost is, is that a, a more advanced Minecraft player who's playing the Java edition, which means they're playing on their laptop or, or desktop, um, can come create a free server, a private server. That means they can can protect their builds, what they build, that somebody can't come tear it down. It also means they can invite their friends in, that they can know who's playing, who they're playing the game with. So it's a bit of a, a safer, trusted environment. What makes Minehut special is, is that we have a big interconnected set of public lobbies. So you can jump out of your private world and you can come in and experience, you know, in that case, the example of like the MTV Wild and Out rap battle show with Nick Cannon. We have these different activities having these public forums that attract almost like the food court in the mall becomes kind of the social hub. Um, and so it's a little bit of um, a private server farm meets um, a social platform. And so it's a, it's a really unique, special product. And that's where we have um, the highest percent of our Minecraft users. And that's the worlds that we own and operate and will bring brands into. Inside of Roblox, we have our own owned and operated worlds like Super League Arcade and, and Anime Battlegrounds, which is where we are the game maker and operator. And then by extension, we have those 200 additional games I mentioned that have plugged into our technology and therefore um, our, uh, our partner network. And so when we're looking at things like the Mattel opportunity or you know, recently when we um, were part of the team that delivered um, a Charlie XCX concert for Samsung, we can look across that network and say, what are, what's the right game to achieve the objectives we're trying to achieve? And so in that case, we have our owned and operated and our franchise, so to speak, game worlds. You know, in in there's a lot going on with Super League. It's not as complicated as it might seem, right? You know, I get uh, uh, listen, and, that, and this is coming from someone that, you know, I, I've never played Roblox or Minecraft, so I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just wrapping my head a little bit around it. But in terms of the company's focus, because yeah. it's similar to some, you know, I, I had an interview on here with a company that did engineered solutions. And one of the key things that they've always talked about that was really difficult that 
people perceived as a difficult thing to understand is that, oh, they work in this high tech or so many different business lines. And, you know, similar to here, I mean, you can be working with anywhere from a Mattel to some of these other different brands and each type of deal or transaction or marketing uh, 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 strategy is completely different. Yes. Right? yes. So, so how does the company focus in on where it can maximize both its revenue? And then of course, you know, I, I believe the company, is the company profitable yet? I'm, I'm, I don't think so. We're, getting, we're pretty close. Pretty, we're pretty okay. close. Okay. Yeah. So, so how does the company focus in on those revenue yeah. generating it's, high, it's, high margin? It's such a good question because when, you know, when we um, first went public, I've always been vocal on earnings calls that look, it's going to take, organic and inorganic growth for us to really get a step change. At that point, you know, a high growth stock still are considered one. Investors were shouting, you know, top line, top line, top line. Um, we kind of woke up at the end of last year after we had done some M&A and had a pretty big step change year of growth. We had gone from about 2 million. We were pre-revenue in, in 2020 and we did a, you know, close to 12 last year and said, okay, and this was exactly how I described it to our board. I said, I feel like I'm on the six lane portion of like the southbound 405 freeway in LA and I'm in the HOV lane and LAX, the exit is a half mile away and I've got to cut over. <laughs> it, it just, I'm in LA yeah. too. I, I totally, I'm, I'm you get the there. reference. Everybody's got yeah. the version of the 405 in big city. But you know, the point is, is like, we can't possibly invest in every one of these lanes. Not every one of these product road maps is equal. There's a lot of synergy between them. They're all gaming centric, and but we need to decide where we have a leadership position and double down and really put our investment and resources there. And so we spent a few days together on that topic and we came out saying we are doubling down on being the um, on metaverse game worlds, those micro worlds that we've been talking about, and the related content network around it, that um, and the and the technology that to support it. So you'll still see us doing things like we've always had a long strategic partnership with Top Golf. We still run um, a broadcast for them every month or two months around their their golf video game world golf tour. Um, you'll see still that we'll sometimes partner and do things for brands that are targeting an over 18 gamer. And that will look more like tournaments and broadcasts because we built that tech right for ourselves through our esports kind of early, you know, history. Um, and because right now, you know, if we can take on that revenue and it's not an operational burden to the company, well, why not? Right. Um, and we're going to continue to diversify into other open world game platforms that do target a larger audience. We just helped iHeart create iHeartland inside Fortnite, you know, and so we we do want to be able to talk to a wide range. But when, when it comes to investment and where we're paying our dollars and where our product and engineering people are focused, it is on building out micro game worlds, more of these that we own or the analytics and 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 ad tech that not only further enhances our monetization of our worlds, but also enhances the monetization of anybody's worlds that want to join up and partner with us. That's the roadmap that we're investing in because that's where we feel we have a leadership position. Very good. And thank you for that that full full picture there too. Um, and I also very much appreciate that you give that type of guidance and talk about that. Maybe not guidance is the right word, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Giving that that type of insight for folks to better understand, because especially right now with gaming, as I said earlier, you know, it, it's one, there's not a lot of profitable companies out there, if, if any, <laughs> and two, yeah. just trying to understand like, well, why? And then where is the growth initiatives from there? Right. You know, I, it's, you're 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 alluding to something that I do. I hope I'm proud of, um, and I hope that it's valued by investors. I think it is. I mean, I have a lot of investors say this to me. I think we really punch above our weight in a couple ways as a company. Um, I think that we are extremely transparent, and I'm going to give credit to my large cap days for that. You know, BP had an ethos of under promise and over deliver. And frankly, there was political consequence if you didn't 
lean into that strategy and transparency. Like, you know, if there's an issue, surface it fast. And so I've tried my best on our earnings calls to just always speak as frankly as I can. In fact, we just did a video for the first time on the last one and kind of took investors into some of our metaverse experiences because it's such a highly visual thing we do. And we felt like that might help even bridge even more people's understanding. But I, we've always tried to just be very um, open. And I think the other place that we've punched above our weight is when we are talking to some of these large brands, um, I think we show up smart. You know, we've built success for ourselves through our own micro game worlds, through the, the significant reach we have with Minehut. We can credibly say we're the right people to take you there because we've been living there for eight years and we know how to build success for you. We can guarantee it. And I think that um, I'm, I've always been proud of that, that even though we're small and we know, you know, we're like this compared to some of the big, the big brands and executives we're talking to. But I think that that we show up smart and trusted and and we've tried our best, even in a tough stock market environment, to always make sure that we hold that line with investors as well. Very good. I very much appreciate that. And I'm sure there's folks listening that very much do as well. So one, one potential risk I wanted to talk about yeah. with you is, is working within the Roblox, you know, community, you know, I, it, 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 it does the company's performance sometimes tie in with where Roblox is performing as well, because especially in this last, you know, you see the last quarter companies losing, you know, it's losing a lot of money. I mean, love to get your insights there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny when we first started uh, Super League and we were focused more on esports. I remember the most popular question investors would say is, you know, right now you're a two game company and, you know, what if one of those games doesn't work out and, and where you, you'll be protected just like an investor would with a portfolio approach to their investment. Um, having three, four, six, eight game titles or platforms is where, you know, you'll, you'll be resilient. Now keep in mind again, you don't play Roblox or Minecraft, you play games inside of it. And there's millions of games, right? And and there's a right. big difference between the thousandth ranked game and the 10th ranked game. Um, you know, and the reality is there are still hundreds of millions of people engaging in both of those platforms. Um, but certainly, you know, as we just recently did a very small activation in Sandbox. I talked about how we supported iHeart and their move into Fortnite. And now we're going to be bringing iHeartland into Roblox as well. We are thinking about how to continue to diversify um, across these different open world game platforms. Um, so again, we can't, there's no advertiser that we can't find the right audience that they seek to reach. But it is, it does create some defensibility for the company as well. I would say even with Roblox's, um, you know, numbers being challenged from an investor point of view, it is still the dominant game where kids are right now. And it's again, because of the richness of um, the, the variety of games inside of it. And it's such a developer friendly um, game. I mean, their their whole platform is designed to have the everyday person have a chance at making a great game and becoming a millionaire. We have a former intern who now um, has created and runs two very popular Roblox games. And a, a top Roblox game can net anywhere from two to $5 million a month. So when you can make that kind of money entrepreneurially, you're going to continue to have you know, very creative, bright people want to come there and try to find a path to their success. Um, but certainly, as you've said, we do think about, you know, how to continue to diversify. I had a, a great gaming executive, a bit of a legend in the gaming space I that uh, really befriended me early on when I first joined Super League. And I asked him the question, you know, you know, is there any of these games that will be like golf? You know, will they just, they'll be around forever. And at that time, I was talking in the context of games like League of Legends and Overwatch and some of these more heightened competitive games. And his answer was no. They're all going to have an end date. They all have a shelf life. Now, there are certainly games like Dota and games out there that have been around for decades. And so how long can a game publisher extend that IP and keep that alive? I think a difference, though, with Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite opening up their Unreal Engine to make it more of a platform. I think the difference with those is, is 
in many ways, it's limitless. As long as those people who make those platforms continue to make the tools rich, you're going to attract people who are going to continue to create worlds that no one can imagine. That, I think, is really where Gen Z and Gen Alpha are interested. I don't think they want a game served up for them as much as they want a capability to get into a game and to be a creator in the game and to change the outcomes. And so it makes me believe that these platforms might be a little more boundless than a traditional video game franchise. Got it. You know, in hearing more about Super League, it's almost like you, it's like a, you know, I remember doing a, a number of interviews with app ma- makers, um, you know, back when, you know, yeah. that was the big thing, right? It was trying to make all these apps. And, you know, what's interesting, the big difference here is that, you know, they were mostly making apps for just Apple and Android. Whereas yeah. when it comes to making, you know, micro worlds, yeah, right now there's Minecraft within that community and then also within the Roblox community. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other potential ones that you can put it into as long as the right. audience is there. That's where you're going to go and create exactly. and put it in. You know, somebody made a comment the other day, you know, in the early days, you know, people with, with the, the onslaught of the internet, people were like, well, I don't want my community. If people love, you know, Ford cars or Red Bull, I don't want them becoming, um, I want them to go to the Red Bull site and, and talk to each other. And, and then naturally some of these platforms like Facebook and other things emerged and groups. And that is where forums or communities around certain brands you know, did start to gather, you know, in this world where could you drive everyone to an app or a website, you know, at some point, um, there were these aggregators. And I think that right now, Minecraft and Roblox are doing that. But you think about iconic IP, you know, Paramount owns Star Trek, you know, we've talked about Barbie earlier today, you know, you think about the fan base for those games, sure, we can make game worlds inside those games where those gamers are, but those could exist on their own too, outside of those platforms. And because the fan base is so strong, people would go to startrackworld.com or barbieworld.com and, and go to those immersive experiences. And so um, I do think that um, to your point, you know, if the audience warrants it, I think you're going to start to see some of these worlds kind of in some ways go off platform, so to speak. Right. They they have the capability to be their own independent world separate from living inside one of these um, existing platforms. Very good. So is that also another opportunity for Super League? Absolutely. What what I've loved about, you know, because I I, got, I sat in um, kind of the equivalent of the CMO job at BP where I was running our global brands. And and it's it's, you know, as we talked about earlier, when I had to get over and start saying I'm versatile, you know, at the start. Um I've been having the most fun conversations with executives I've ever had in the company. And the reason is, is because I've actually stood in their shoes. And, and the conversation is changing because I bear it with, and it's important in earnings calls, I talk a lot about our pipeline health. You know, a year and a half ago, our average advertiser deal size was 50, 75K. Today, our average deal size is 250K. 70 to 80% repeat every quarter, meaning the brands and the agencies are coming back for more and they're putting more dollars to work. Um, we did, did our first seven figure deal earlier this summer. So the, the size of the, the deals are getting bigger. That's because we're that end in solution. We can deliver them all the elements of their campaign. But what I'm loving talking to these brands about now is, hey, fine, I'll run a four week campaign for you. You know, that to you is just kind of, frankly, it's kind of, it's a lot to us, right? To do two, three, 400K deal with a big brand. But to them, it's kind of a rounding error on their marketing budget, right? The bigger question we should be talking about is, is why are you spending this money for a four-week campaign when you could have a persistent world? And in that persistent world, you don't, it's not you spending money out money's coming back to you. It's a new revenue stream. You can be selling in-game merch. You can be selling the media inventory inside the Star Trek world. Think about how many brands would like to advertise in the Star Trek universe. You know, so we're having, it's starting with campaigns. That's our way in the door. And we have success with them. But then we get to come in top down and, and have a different conversation, which is 
why wouldn't you have a permanent um, universe and why can't this be a new revenue stream for you? I'll give you a perfect example. I think the CEO of Ralph Lauren recently stated in an earnings call that one of the fastest growing new channels for customer acquisition and also revenues, um, now again, relatively speaking, but fastest growing as a percent is um, selling digital polo shirts inside these game platforms. You know, an eight-year-old buys a digital polo shirt and then goes to mom and says, take me to Macy's or to Marshall's or Kohl's or wherever. I want an orange polo shirt for my real life uh, person too. And so, you know, the fact that Gucci and Nike have worlds inside and are talking to young gamers is proof that every, if, if Gucci can rationalize talking to a 13 year old gamer who does not have the money at this time to buy a Gucci wallet or purse, well, then, then it's hard to not be able to make the argument of why other brands should be in there and, and starting to build affinity with this, with this young, you know, future consumer. I, I, I'm, I, I dread the day that my kid will be like, oh yeah, I just bought this, this virtually. Now I want it over here. Like, I know. What? How, hey, give me my credit of, card. <laughs> one of the biggest sponsors of iHeartland for us is a state farm. Right. Oh, interesting. So starting, you know, even when you're, you know, and Jake from State Farm is going to be, you know, they're hanging out and and, you know, we're increasingly doing a lot more with automotive companies, you know, talking to a 12 or 13 year old now and getting them excited about, you know, the day they're dreaming of their first car purchase. It's 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 a smart strategy. Gotcha. So this is one question that I also ask everybody uh, when they come on here and we've kind of alluded to it because I'm, I'm, I'm working through it, especially because, you know, like I said, when it comes to gaming companies, I'm still trying to figure out every which way things can be done. But, you know, the company has been public now for a little bit, been a public company CEO. What have been some of the more frequently asked questions and or what investors get most confused about, you know, when they're first being introduced yeah. or after maybe they've done a little bit of research? Yeah, I I think there's a few buckets to this. There's usually it's never hard um, to have an investor be interested in talking to us. And I think that's because it's a space. It's like cannabis. You know, it's like it's one of those speculative spaces that everybody's intrigued about gaming and metaverse games. And and so they want to learn. And so we have a lot. We do a lot of investor outreach and have a lot of introduction conversations I do sometimes feel more times than not that they're so early in their learning curve. They're 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 definitely some ways away from the comfort of making an investment in the general category. But they want to learn. Maybe they have a grandchild who's into Roblox or, you know, and so I find that often um, there's a lot of interest. Then once we've met with them, you know, and I still get this. I just was asked this question yesterday from an investor. Um the most common thing I'm hearing right now um, with the current context is the first thing that's the positive and the pat on the back is, um, you know, good for you guys. You gave guidance that you were going to do north of 20 this year versus 11 prior year, 2 million the year prior. Like you guys, and we gave that guidance at the start of the year and we haven't revised it. Um, and they're saying, this is impressive. Most micro caps are now suffering a little bit with the looming recession or recession, however you want to phrase it, you guys continue, you're showing that you're somewhat recession resilient. And also we told you top line and you're doing it. These are pretty sizable step changes. Um, and then the second thing they say now um, that they weren't saying a year ago, the same is because uh, it what before was just top line, top line, whatever it takes. And now it's like, oh, but by the way, while the stock market isn't your fault, Anne, it is your problem. So um, our our horizons have truncated on wanting you to be cash flow positive. And so we get it, right? They want they want both now. And so we've been able to, with some pretty aggressive cost cutting, take about five million out of our um, our annual cost. Um, um, we've also, you know, again, we have not done anything that won't um, sacrifice our top line. That's the line I've drawn. And I try again to be very transparent with investors that any deeper cost reductions would sacrifice top line. And I do think that's trying to save our way to success. I think that's a mistake. We're at this really unique, you know, inflection point. And 
And that to, and this and we've got this lean position. And to me, that doesn't feel like the right strategic decision for the company. And and the board is very supportive of that. Um, but those those are often kind of um, you know commonly the types of of comments or, or questions that we get. The other thing that happened with our stock is we became a bit of a meme stock. And so sometimes investors will be like, huh, like you know, you're down a lot versus, you know, a year and a half ago. And just like I want us to all kind of, um, you know, classic statistics class, like take out the tails, you know, I would say it, it's not for me to say what our share price and market cap could be, but boy, I can't imagine it getting much lower right now. I mean, if if you ever wanted to make a case for a company being a, a gross stock at a reasonable price, I would hope we'd fall in one of those buckets, you know, Um but equally, we did have this wild anomaly where there were rampant rumors on Reddit and Wall Street bets that GameStop was going to buy us. And um, we traded 10x our float um, in March 2020 um, in one single day. <laughs> and so um, we have this wild kind of tail on the other side, which, you know, was nonsensical as well, right? And the answer somewhere in the middle, but but we think that there's an opportunity for our, our our share price to really improve as the as some of the market the weight of the market is pulling you know a lot of good companies down. We 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 do not remain unscathed. That must have been a trip during it that time. Let me tell you what happened was um, Ryan Cohen, the um, the founder of Chewy, who's now the chair of the GameStop board posted in Wall Street Bets a picture of a McDonald's ice cream cone and the pic a picture of a frog with no words. And um, and somebody looked at my background and saw that I worked at McDonald's, um, um, you know, for a while in my career. And I also ran a company called Project Frog and deduced that it was a nod to me. And I guess there's some rule on Wall Street bets. Like you can't be have a market cap less than several billion to be even your ticker symbol to be on there. But for a good five days until the moderators could catch up and scrub the SLGG ticker symbol out, our stock went crazy. Um, and um, and we have a very avid, wonderful um, um, Super League subreddit that that was created. You know, once they got kicked out of the Wall Street Pets thread, and and they're very passionate um, retail investors who do a lot of serious analytics on the stock and are all over all over our Qs and Ks and a very impressive smart group of retail investors who are not giving up on Super League. So we appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to talk directly to those. Red. Don't come from my head. I apologize if I missed anything. I, <laughs> we're, we're all doing our best. I'm sure there's folks out there that. I probably ask even better questions than me, but you know, we're doing, we're doing our best. I hope, you know, okay. Um, <laughs> so another question I have for you, um, we talked about one potential downside risk a little bit earlier with, you know, working very closely with, with Roblox and creating worlds on there, you know, in, in your opinion, just giving the full picture, what would you say are some of the company's other downside risks? Yeah. I mean, the, gosh, it's a, it's a tough one. I, I would still go public all over again. Um, it's not easy though, right? Um, I'll tell you why, you know, right when we were decided, we had only ever raised common stock. Um, so we were a little bit of the anti VC model. Um, it was a little bit more like, you know, why shouldn't the employees and every class of investors hold the same class of stock? We believed in that. And that was, um, so it was a little bit of like an underdog or, you know, um, positioning, um, and so we were at a point where if we had brought in any more money, it would have come in preferred and it would have squashed down those early people who believed in us. And so that's why we explored going public early. And then if you watched any of the Theranos documentaries or podcasts, that's right when those were hot. And, and you start to realize that, like, look, a lot of these unicorns, they stay private so long that by the time they go public, there's nothing for the retail investor to participate in the upside. And so. I'd still do it again. I'd do it again, partly for those principles, but I'd also do it because when our stock ran, like it did, you know, with that GameStop rumor, we were able to raise money. 
And, and I believe in the virtue of being public and the access to the public markets, the chance for the everyday investor to participate in a big growth stock, um, but also the transparency we talked about before. You know, I, when you're running early stage companies, you know, everyone's got these decks with these crazy hockey stick projections. And you've got these pieces of paper, you know, these term sheets with this valuation number that is just a number on a piece of paper. And I, I think it's freeing to let the market decide. So I would do it all over again. Um, that said, the, the last seven or eight months, it is, it's tough to be public because you kind of keep thinking you're doing everything right. You know, we're hitting our numbers, we're beating estimates, you know, and so you have to, I would say, you know, it's, it's, cre it's, it's had to make us dig in with a little more fortitude and a little more resiliency um, as a company um, and just say like, you know, again, I do it all over again, but boy, you know, since January, you know, I can't even believe it's almost October. I don't know what just happened. You know, thank heaven we're still delivering on our top line projections, right? Um, but I look out at a lot of other micro caps that I know we bump into each other at conferences and, you know, when we commiserate over a cocktail, um, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough road. I think Super League is positioned though to to break out as the markets rebound. Um, uh, but that's really top of mind. And ensuring we have a healthy balance sheet, right? We've got to be able to ride out these storms that are again, like I said earlier, aren't our fault, but they are a problem. Um, so I think those are the things that I'm thinking about the most. And then probably to another challenge or opportunity is. When I talk about those 70 million unique players we reach, we monetize a very small percent of that advertising inventory. It's why we've announced partnerships with iHeart and others, global network sales partners to help us sell the inventory. We can't sell it fast enough. We have an opportunity in front of us to not be giving 20 million in annual guidance. We could be giving 200 million with what we have in front of us. And I don't think it's a, a fault of ours that we aren't selling it fast enough. I think we have an education and awareness challenge and we need to leverage other people's sales teams and reach so that we can sell faster. You know, we have a domestic sales force, but we have tons of international ad inventory. And so that's the pressure I feel and the team feels is we have something that is like the shiny new keys as far as the future of in-game advertising. And it is a it is a race to see if we can take these very innovative products that are ahead and get them in front of people as fast as possible. If this company is, is giving a hundred million in guidance, I think the stock price will take care of itself. Very good. One other question that I also had to from, from a corporate level that I saw in the most recent deck is, you know, amongst my expert interviews, you know, we talk a lot about insider ownership, talk a lot about, you know, um, they want to see alignment. Mm -hmm. um, Company, I think it said it was about 8%. You know, it, it, I'd love to get your insights there. Is there any plans to, you know, do, I don't know, necessarily buy back, but is there is there any plans to increase that? Yeah, no. I mean, we all have, all my, my incentives are all tied to share price. I mean, that was a decision that the board made to say, look, you know, and you need to put your money where your mouth is and you need to align those incentives. And so, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not in the money until the share price materially moves at certain tiers and levels. And that's all been made readily available, all that information to send a really strong message to investors that, that we are well aligned. And then we do have board members and some of us who have bought during open windows. It's a, it's a shame that a lot of times we'll, we'll have people say, well, why aren't you buying right now? And we can't really say, well, the window's closed. Because then we're going to create speculate. Well, why is the window closed? What's happening? And so we have to be very thoughtful about, you know, gosh, I mean, with a with a share price, you know, sitting at a, a dollar, of course, I would love at times to be more active and buying more shares. But you know, we also have limitations as far as you know MNPI and and some of that. And so um, that's been a, a little bit of, you know, that's probably one of the downsides of being public is there's so much you want to be able to say to investors about exciting things, conversations happening, and you can't. Um, 
And so we don't have those crazy hockey stick projections and all that wild fantasy stuff that used to be in the decks when you're private and chasing money. But equally, we have to be rooted in what we were able to speak about right now. And um, but certainly I've been at this for seven years and and I am um, incented to ensure that we get this share price up by several fold. Very good. Yeah, no, when we when you see those those crazy numbers, especially, uh, you know, sometimes I ask about Tam on here and there's times when like there's no like I could ask you about Tam, but it's like, why? You know, you're just <laughs> you're going to be stuck in a position where like, do you want me to say multi-million? Like, yeah, it just, yeah, yeah. It, like you're, you know, yeah. everyone's going to hear that and be like, oh, OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will but, say that, that sure. they did. They have projected that the end game advertising market. So advertising inside of, of video games is right now projected to be about 56 billion by 2024. I think the bigger question is, is again, social media, internet advertising. It's it's not been wildly successful. It's I think you're going to see more and more of that start to pivot towards these more experiential type units. Um, that really create kind of more brand engagement. I think a bigger question, and I'm not a long time ad executive, but where are all those TV dollars going to go? Because nobody cares anymore about the 8:30 on Tuesday night um, spot. And you know, if it's not the Super Bowl or a really kind of high audience engagement, um, and I think it's it's time for that whole linear TV ad model is going to have a pretty big shakeup. And I think that will be interesting to see how those dollars start to get scattered across some of these that really what we would call the, the next marketing channel, the new social platform, it's games. Very good. All right. So my one of my final questions for you here today, you know, where do you in your opinion, where do you want to see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are some of the inflection points that will get you there? Yeah, um, I want to see the company sitting with, you know, a valuation in the 500 million to a billion space. And the way to do that is going to be more of these um, top down big brand partnerships where we are taking big IPN and owning and operating worlds. Um, and all the media inventory associated with those worlds. Um, so when I talk about the examples of Mattel and Paramount and other partners that we have, I think that that's where we will be able to participate in a bigger way in the economy beyond just the ad model and that tech that we have. Um, and and I think those will be the game changers for the company when you know a, an advertiser is coming to us and putting ten million dollars to work per year, you know, not five hundred k or not a year ago, just 50K. And so um, those are the types of deals that currently I'm trying to spend. If I'm not talking to investors, I'm trying to, to work on um, where, you know, all of a sudden we, we really have, really don't need 500 customers a year. We need 10, 20, um, and, and we have a pretty successful, successful and sustainable business. Very good. All right. My final question for you then here today. Um, you've talked about the some of the challenges of being a public company CEO. Not an easy job at all. But how would you evaluate your experience thus far? And is there anything that you would change about it or you want to see changed? Yeah. I mean, look, I, w I would love it if we all hadn't gone through the last, you know, 10 months of the stock market. You know, did I for need... Sure. Did I need to experience that for the a chapter in the book? Maybe, but I don't know. I mean, um, I guess what it always does teach you, though, as we've alluded to already on, on today's chat, is you know you do keep finding layers of resiliency. You have to keep digging deeper. You've got to keep getting creative and innovating, staying positive for yourself, for your team, for the brand partners you work with. Um, I like I said earlier, I would do it all over again. I. There's a thing when you've worked about 20 years in large companies, you think you've seen it all. You really do. And you know what? I lived around the world. I ran company. I have I have seen a lot. Um, and it was another thing to run a private startup that I learned some things. I kind of learned the Silicon Valley way and the lingo and and all of that. Um, but I, I'm pretty proud of being able to say that uh, we took a company that had one kind of point of view 
Um, we pivoted some, you know, as I said at the start, we cast a wider net. When you look at the sizable reach and the, the, the monetization opportunity in front of us right now, if we don't grow at all, just what we could monetize today based on what we're sitting on, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that we could have a hundred, two hundred million dollar revenue year if we optimize what's right in front of us. I mean, so that that gives me pride. And I think the other thing, the reason I do it all over again is, like I said, I thought I had kind of seen it all and learned it all. And I now look back and say, I took a company public. That that in itself is a wild learning curve. Learning the ways of micro cap, which we all know is not like mid cap and large cap. Um, and, and, and learning, you know, well, who are those constituents and how do you, how do you stay successful inside the, the, the struggles of micro cap, but also stay focused on breaking out of it, right? That's what we have to do because we need more stability in the stock. Um, so I, I like the fact that I've been working now close to 30 years, hate to admit it, but in the, you know, I'm still learning. And I don't know if I would have guessed them, that I'd say that those words, you know, five or 10 years ago. Very good. All right. Well, with that, I think we're there. And where can our audience go and find more information on Super League Gaming? Yeah. So go to superleague.com and also check out our superleague.com IR site. And thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. It was a very frank, open, honest discussion. Not everybody has it, but I... I you, you gave you, a lot. Bobby. You gave. You really gave a lot today. And I, I really do appreciate that. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.